What's up, everyone? Welcome to this week's episode of The Point. I'm your host, Anna Kasparian, and we have an all-female panel on the show today. In fact, let's go ahead and meet our panelists. We have Wendy Carrillo, who is a returning panelist. She's a journalist and radio show host. You know I love having you on the show. Love being here. Thank <laughs> you. Yes, thank you for coming on. And Maitha Al-Hassan is also a returning guest. Uh, you did a great job last time. Lots of really interesting points. So I'm very excited to see what you have to say about the topics today. And thank you for having me and saying my last name correctly. It's <laughs> very important. It's a beautiful name. All right, so let me tell you guys what we're going to talk about on the show today. Of course, there's the longer version of the Ray Rice assault video that has been leaked or released by TMZ. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of that story. And then we're also going to discover uh, who these teenagers are who did this really terrible ice bucket prank on an autistic kid. It's a really terrible story and it touches on the issue of bullying. And also, CeeLo has been dropped from more concerts after he made a very questionable statement on Twitter about the issue of rape. And also, do bras cause cancer? Some studies indicate yes, others indicate no. We'll get into the details of that. And we'll end the show on a discussion about open carry. Panera joins a number of other chain restaurants that have asked people to not show up to their restaurant with assault rifles out in the open. So before we get to all of that, um, I do want to start off with a story that has been making headlines this week. The Ray Rice video featuring him basically punching his then fiance at the time and knocking her out has been released by TMZ. It is a difficult video to watch and believe it or not, opinions toward that video have been split. I want you guys to take a look at it and then we'll discuss it further. They had gotten into a verbal altercation and then it continued in the elevator where he punched her with a single punch to the face, basically. She hits the rail with her head, and then she's unconscious. And then you see her trying to drag her body outside of the elevator. She's unresponsive. And uh, the AP was somehow able to obtain a better video that gives even more detail into what happened. And even though they haven't released that video, they do say that it makes clear that uh, Janae Palmer, his fiance at the time, who is now his wife, did spit on him uh, a few times and that she did attempt to strike him as well. So it was a physical altercation um, and both sides uh, did participate in it. And I should note that she faced assault charges as well as he did. However, there was a, a trial intervention where he was able to get involved in a program so he wouldn't have to face further prosecution. So he doesn't have to worry about this being on his record. However, the NFL uh, has suspended him indefinitely and the Ravens have decided to uh, let him go. They ended his contract. Now, as I said, there are a lot of differing opinions as to what went down and how it went down. And I want to know what you guys mm -hmm. think. Maitha, let me start off with you. What are your thoughts on this? Make your point. Firstly, this video is cringeworthy. It's really difficult to watch it a second time. Secondly, what I think is really interesting was the NFL's initial response, which was only a two-game suspension. And then after it saw the reaction through social media, did it decide to to release him, to suspend him throughout the whole season and the Ravens to release him indefinitely. So for me, I'm just, not, not that this is the most important thing, but I'm really concerned with the NFL more interested in protecting its brand than the issue of domestic violence. Yeah, the NFL had denied ever seeing the, uh, the tape when they had made that two-game suspension. Um, but there are people who worked at the hotel who have spoken out on condition of anonymity, and they said, no, no, no. The NFL had seen the tape. There's no question about it. So that is a little bit of a he said, she said situation. But considering the fact that that original video was released by TMZ, I mean, they knew that a two-game suspension was probably a little too lenient in that case. Now, um, Wendy, before you make your point, I want to read a comment that Janae Palmer released via Instagram after she found out that Ray Rice uh, was going to have his contract terminated by the Ravens. She said the following, No one knows the pain that the media and unwanted opinions from the public has caused my family. To make us relive a moment in our lives that we regret every day is a horrible thing. To take something away from the man I love that he has worked his ass off for all his his life to gain ratings is horrific. She continues to write, uh, this is our life. What don't you all get? If your intentions were to hurt us, embarrass us, make us feel alone, take all the happiness away, you've succeeded on so many levels. And you read that and you can't help but empathize with, with, with what she's going through. Wendy, what are your thoughts? Make your point. Well, we definitely empathize with her, but it's also very, it's very noticeable that she is not fully aware of the 
of the social implications of what everybody is witnessing. So in, in her statement, she's defending um, her, her abuser. Um, and that's very common in these type of scenarios. We know that 85% of domestic violence victims are women. We know that every minute 24 people are victims of domestic violence. And so it's, it's interesting to see her say something like that, but I think, but it, you know, it's, it's unfortunate that she's in, this, in, the, in the limelight because of this, but I also wanna say like, what was she doing like spitting at him to begin with? I mean, it's very controversial. Mm -hmm. Men should not be hitting women, obviously, but women also need to be able to control their emotions Absolutely. and the physical violence against men. Yeah, and, and I think that no one should discredit or, or belittle the importance of never resorting to violence under any circumstance. So right. if even if she had started it, it still doesn't give him a pass to hit her, but she should have never started hitting him, right? right. And so, and that's not to victim blame, that's just common sense, right? right? You never resort to violence. You find another way to deal with whatever argument or situation you're dealing with. Now, in regard to Janae Palmer's statement, you know, it's a little bit of a catch-22. And the reason why I say that is because on one hand, the country is having a much needed discussion on domestic violence. We're talking talking about something that we hadn't really talked about as extensively as we're talking about now. But at the same time, I mean, I feel that now she is dealing with insult to injury because the fact that he lost his job, she's going to definitely, you know, be hurt from that as well. And then there's also the element of the number of people who are defending Ray Rice and his decision to knock her out with a single punch. And so she has to live through those comments and she has to live through some of the victim blaming that's going on in the media right now. And that's definitely unfortunate as well. So the question for this story is, have you ever been part of a violent act or have you ever witnessed a violent act? Wendy. Well, I feel like I'm gonna have my house of cards, uh, Claire Underwood moment because when she you know, really revealed her own story, but many years ago, I actually was in a relationship. I dated someone who had a really bad temper that I didn't know about, and we went away on the weekend, and we got into some kind of argument, and he punched the wall and threw something, and it like broke, and I remember thinking and being in that situation and feeling kind of out of body, mm -hmm. like, why is this happening to me? How could I allow something like this to happen? And then, then you start blaming yourself. I should have known better. I shouldn't have come. I shouldn't have done this and that. And and you just don't know. And I was very scared. Um, and I and I remember thinking like, how did I ever get myself in this situation? And most importantly, how am I going to get out? Mm -hmm. And luckily, like nothing happened. It was just a bad fight. But I was scared because I had never been through something like that in my life. And I and if I have gone through it, and I consider myself like a strong, independent woman, and all mm -hmm. the, and all those things, I could only imagine like another relationship where maybe somebody d isn't as strong. I think that it's more common than people realize. Absolutely. Yeah, Matha, what about you? Before I make my point, I do want to jump in <laughs> to some things you said because they, yeah. there are a lot of red flags that could be mm -hmm. uh, deconstructed. And one thing that I just want to make a strong point about is we live in a patriarchy. Mm -hmm. So my feelings are that even if a woman does provoke, spits, does anything, says anything verbally um, abusive to the man, the law is not on her side to begin with. Mm -hmm. And the prevailing social order is not as well. So I think we have to take another step, another measure to protect any woman from any physical violence. And to also make the point that the um, every single Sunday, every single Monday night, we watch these men assaulting each other on the field, mm -hmm. right? So there is a larger conversation we need to have about a culture that celebrates it through sports. And then when it, when it bleeds the line between relationships, mm -hmm. this is when we want to call foul play. And we should call foul play. But, you know, there's a distinguishing line. Yeah, I mean, look, this definitely kind of goes off the format of the show, which I think in some cases is fine. I think this is an important thing to discuss. But one thing that I will say to that is, I think far too often people give a pass to women when it comes to issues mm -hmm. of domestic violence. Yeah. So if a woman is spitting, or if a woman is using physical violence to lash out on a man or a woman, maybe she's in a same-sex relationship, right? She should face assault charges, right? And I actually, in, in issues of domestic violence, I actually disagree that the law is on the man's side. I think a lot of times the law is much harsher to men who are accused of domestic violence as opposed to women who are accused of domestic violence. Because there is this mindset that women can't do any damage. You know, they're weak. They don't have the physical ability to Not harm someone, right? But mm -hmm. I think in some cases they do. So assault is assault regardless of gender. Mm -hmm. However, my ideology on it is if you are a larger person and you can cause severe physical damage to someone, 
don't fight back physically unless that person is an imminent threat to you, right? right? right. Find other ways to deal with it. Leave the room, push them aside, do whatever you can. Don't resort to punching them in the face, right? right? You have to be the bigger person, both physically and mentally. Um, so did you uh, have something to say about uh, violent acts? Have yes. you ever been part of one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, yeah, I keep on diverting the topic, but okay. um, you know, something else that I think needs to be part of the conversation is the invisible violence, the infrared violence we see every day. And for me, it's just continuously driving past Skid Row in Los Angeles, which ha houses the, one of the biggest homeless communities in all of the US, super high concentration. And once you just leave the area of high-rise apartments in downtown LA, you see a soup kitchen with many different generations of people who are homeless and no recourse. And I, I'm one of those blind people that drive by every day because I can't look at that. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean. Different kind of violence. Yeah. Well, that is a different kind of violence. Mm -hmm. You know, my situation is kind of similar to what you went through, Wendy. My very first boyfriend, uh, was a bad seed, okay? And, and my parents knew it, everyone knew it, but I was a teenager, I was con definitely convinced I was in love with him, and then he was like a really jealous type of guy, so if I spent time with friends, he thought that like I was fooling around, he always wanted me to spend time with him. So one day he became physically violent, he didn't actually harm me physically, he didn't punch me or anything like that, but I remember him grabbing a knife as if he was gonna come after me and harm Ooh, me with the knife. Oh wow. And I knew he wasn't actually gonna do it, right? I was scared, but right. deep down inside I'm like, he's not gonna stab me with the knife. He came close and then I left and then that was it. And I don't know where he is or what he's doing now, but there are women that don't, they don't recover from situations like yeah. that. So That's two of three. Yeah, I know. I know. On this panel, on this all-female panel. Mm. And I think that who you are mm. as a woman really determines whether or not you're going to be victimized like that again in the future, mm -hmm. right? So thankfully, I was able to walk away from that, and then I was really picky with who I dated after. Of um, but for a lot of women, they do internalize it, and they think that it's part of who they are. They think it's their fault. And so they seek out relations, relationships like that kind of subconsciously. So it's a really complicated issue, and I'm glad that we discussed it on the show. I know that oftentimes we talk about lighter stories, but time to time, stories like this need national attention. Now tell us what you guys think. Have you ever been a victim of violence or or have you ever seen violence but never did anything to stop it? And also, what are your thoughts on the Ray Rice story? Again, it's very controversial, but we love hearing from you. Comment in the section below. We'll see you guys soon. There was a really terrible ice bucket challenge prank that happened near Cleveland, Ohio, and it involved an autistic teenager who thought that he was just going to have a bucket of ice water thrown at him, but something else happened. Uh, the teenagers threw uh, a bucket of urine, feces, spit, and cigarette butts at him. Now, the mother, surprisingly, the mother of the victim, wanted to release the video to the media to kind of raise awareness about the type of bullying that goes on. Otherwise, I wouldn't show this video because I feel terrible for what happened to this kid, but since since the mother wants people to know about it, we're going to show it to you. Just know it's difficult to watch, and then we'll discuss it a little more. He's seen standing in the driveway of a home off school grounds where he's in just his underwear as a bucket of fluid was poured from the roof of the garage. In the bucket, urine, feces, spit, and cigarette butts. So this was a way of the teenagers basically bullying an autistic kid because nothing says that you're cool like bullying an autistic kid, right? Well, after this story broke, uh, there were a number of celebrities, including Drew Carey and um, Jenny McCarthy, who basically offered $10,000 for any information leading up to the identification of these teenagers. Now, that was a little bit of vigilante justice there, and some people questioned whether or not that was a good idea. However, local authorities were able to identify five teenagers who were involved in this incident. No charges have been filed yet. However, cops do believe that they do face criminal charges for what happened. What do you guys think about this story? Maitha, let me start with you. Make your point. Full disclosure, I couldn't even watch it the first time or the second time when you just played it. It hits a little close to home. My brother is autistic and he's been the victim of similar sort of pranks. I'm sorry, I'm, I probably will get um, emotional to, in, in the heat of this discussion. Um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely repugnant. I, I can't say more than that. And of course, this was bound to happen with these ALS ice bucket challenges. Somebody was going to use it um, in a way that wasn't honoring w what the challenge was designed for. And um, it's also interesting to note that this challenge, uh, you know, where did it come up from, right? Because so far in the US, I believe there's 12,000 diagnosed cases of ALS. And not that we should put our attention into any other thing, but why has this become so popular? Mm -hmm. 
so quickly? A lot of it has to do with viral marketing. I mean, the person behind it was obviously very smart when it came to viral marketing. And I think for a lot of people, it was about raising awareness for ALS. But I think for other people, it was more about, hey, can I get my video to go viral? And maybe that was what was behind what these teenagers did. Yes, there was the bullying element, but maybe in their minds, like, oh, this is so crazy and this is so clever. You know, this is definitely going to go viral. Maybe we're going to get the most attention. By the way, keep in mind that this is an autistic kid. They they were unable to identify the five teenagers, which means that this kid didn't even know what he was really getting himself into. I mean, he wasn't able to identify them. Wendy, make your point. Uh, I just think it it is so incredibly tragic. Um, and I couldn't help, when I first read the story, I couldn't help but think, like, this is a real version of Stephen King's Carrie. Like, mm -hmm. instead of blood, it's urine and, like, mm -hmm. feces. And, and this poor kid, and I just, I feel like, Kids nowadays are so desensitized when it comes to what it what it means to be mean. And because everybody wants to have their 15 seconds of Instagram glory or six seconds of Vine glory, they forget that they're doing things that actually hurt other people. And they're just doing it because they want to go viral. They want to go on Tosh.0. Oh. They want to, they want us to be talking about it. They want the new, and so it's, it, there's a lack of there's a lack of moral compass mm -hmm. when it comes to like how social media has impacted a whole new generation of people that live to show their lives online, yeah. and that that I think is is a really sad point of uh, society nowadays, especially with these young kids that just don't know the difference yeah. and they just want to be famous even for a minute yeah. at whatever cost. It's so depressing. It's such a hard video to see, especially when you consider how you would react if it was your own kid. I just want to give the mother all the credit in the world because she handled this the right way. Had I been the mother, I don't know if I would be able to restrain myself. And I'm not an advocate for violence, you guys definitely know that, but when it comes to someone you love being harmed in that kind of way, I mean, it's hard to keep your temper under control. All right, the question is, have you ever been pranked or pranked someone else? Share your story, and obviously we can get a little lighter now. I mean, that was a really <laughs> difficult story to talk about, but maybe you were part of a fun, fr uh, fun prank. Wendy? My sister and I constantly talk about this, but this was like fun pranks. This wasn't like crazy pranks like this, but I remember we were just kids and like the Flaming Hot Cheetos had just come out and it was like this cool thing. And I think she was like six at the time and I'm older. And so she was always like that sister that was like bugging and like want, wanting to be around. And so I gave her a bag, like try this. Oh my and gosh. so she, um, she was started crying and she needed milk, but Aww. it was just like, it was like a story. No, it's okay. <laughs> she just got me back though, literally like 15 years later, she gave me this little thing. She's like, oh, try this. I thought it was like a smoothie or something. Uh -huh. It was in a little tiny cup. And it was like a sauce made of habaneros. Oh my god! And gosh. so she's like, that's what you get for making me. Oh damn, like, talk wow. about holding a grudge, man. That's amazing. It's on, though. No, it's, it's on. on. It's on. <laughs> Matha, what about you? Well, I'm going to be a little bit of a Debbie Downer or a melancholy Matha. Um, so my, <laughs> my, my, as I had mentioned when you asked me about my reaction to the stories and making my point, um, my brother was the victim growing up or a survivor of some of these pranks. Like, school children would tie him up and throw rocks at him oh and he was autistic God. so this if I was present for that I don't know what I would do to these children their parents yeah. but to give you something on a lighter note um, I did pull a prank on another sibling not him um, I <laughs> I convinced one of my siblings that he was adopted uh -huh. because he had blonde hair and both my parents had darker hair and the rest of us all had darker hair and so he went throughout the whole day believing that he was adopted and, um, <laughs> damn, that's freaking harsh. I didn't make that. I did not see that coming. Wow. <laughs> no, but yeah, I, I wow. mean, I'm done. That's like mean, Matha. Kali Matha. When you have five siblings, you have to test out pranks yeah, on yeah. each one. That's amazing. I have a fun prank. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, more on the Cheetos uh, line. I was, okay. more, I was more of a, like, I guess a victim of a prank, but it was a fun prank. Um, so, uh, there was like this random mannequin left in front of my apartment building and it was super creepy like I was with uh, my friend we were walking over to my apartment and then we see the mannequin we both get startled when we see it and so we get back into my apartment and he's like oh shit I forgot something in the car and he leaves right he leaves takes the mannequin puts it in in my front door right front door and then this is what happens we have a video of it he took video oh no can you check Side. Just Thank right you. out there in front. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
I love that video just because he sounds like a good old country boy and he's like a Cuban guy. Um, but Are you trying to go viral? Was that the purpose of putting this? That's it was, exactly what it was. It scared the shit out of me. Yeah. And then that day, um, I left for work, and when I came back, the mannequin was at my front door again. Oh. So I got startled two times in a row. Anyway, very fun guy. Uh, tell us if you guys have ever been a victim of the prank. And also tell us what you think about this ice bucket prank. Um, what would you do if you were in this situation or if it was some loved one of yours that was a victim of this type of prank? We want to hear from you. Comment in the section below and we'll see you guys soon. CeeLo Green has been dropped from a number of concerts throughout the country after he made controversial statements about rape on his Twitter account. Now, he made these statements after he pleaded guilty, or I should say no contest, to slipping an ecstasy pill into a girl's drink back in 2012. And first of all, that is the worst possible thing you can do. Um, he was also accused of raping her after that occurred. Um, however, his very his lack of remorse to that situation, which was displayed on Twitter, probably enraged people even more. He tweeted the following, if someone is passed out, they're not with you consciously, so with implies consent. I don't even know what that means. Like, that isn't even really a coherent statement, and it's like grammatically incorrect. I don't know what's going on. But then he also tweets the following, women who have really been raped, remember. Wow. As you guys see, what we showed you were tweets that were revealed by other people because he ended up deleting those tweets after he got criticized for them. Now, just to give you a sense of how many music festivals have banned him or have dropped him from their uh, shows, there were festivals in DC and also the Louisiana Festival, also the Gretna Heritage Festival, and Freedom Live, which is run by the Navy. And so uh, Freedom Live did release a statement. I want to read it to you guys. They write that, unfortunately, one of the performers we signed for the JB AB Freedom Live show on 20th of September recently posted comments on social media that we consider to completely be inconsistent with Navy Corps values. Regardless of intent or context, the lack of sensitivity towards an issue that is one of the greatest challenges facing our Navy is unacceptable. As a result, we have made the decision to pull CeeLo Green from the Freedom Live event on September 20th. So I feel like this is usually what happens when someone uh, in the limelight says something pretty controversial. They usually lose sponsorship endorsements, uh, show opportunities. What do you guys think about this? Wendy, make your point. You know, it reminds me of Chris Brown and Rihanna. It just, there's all, oftentimes celebrities say things that are just off the wall. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I love CeeLo's music and I think he's an amazing coach on The Voice. And I'm, I'm a fan of his. And he just dropped a new album. And yeah. so to hear him or see on Twitter him say these things, I, I'm I'm sad, you know. I'm 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 ashamed of him. And then it's like across the line of like fan and person. And when do you when do you love somebody's art and but dislike who they are as an individual? Yeah, there's something kind of similar. I mean, there are parallels. Mm -hmm. It's not too similar with corporations or companies that you really like buying from. You're a fan of their product, and then you find out that they donate uh, political contributions to really, really loathsome individuals, right? right. And then, how, can you appreciate one thing and kind of brush off the other? That's a right. really big conundrum that people yeah, deal with. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's it's difficult. And I think what he said is just incredibly disgraceful. I obviously. totally agree, Mesa. Two things. One, first off, is that social media has proved to be a curse and a blessing, and a blessing for celebrities because it gives them opportunity to self-promote and to promote their companies and any projects that they have coming out. And then it's been a curse because we've been witness to these diuretic stream of consciousness thinking tweets. I mean, he's not the first to retract a statement that has been horrend that is absolutely horrendous. Uh, secondly, I find it really interesting that Freedom Live says that it wants to drop uh, CeeLo because it doesn't align with its Navy Corps values. And interesting enough, something that we don't talk about enough is the fact that rape cases, not just in the Navy, but all of the military have been concealed or go unreported to an incredible degree. I, I mean, one statistic I found was that in 2012, the Pentagon did um, an estimated survey of how many people uh, men or women had been victims or survivors of rape, and the number was 26,000. Of that 26,000, some 3,000 were reported. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. It's it's incredible how many go unreported because oftentimes uh, people who are victims of rape in the military have to report that rape to someone that they work under, and usually the person they work under is the one that wants to brush it under the rug the most because he will probably he or she will be you know 
in bed with a rapist. Right. Let's keep right. it real. So yeah. this yeah. is not just about CeeLo, this is yeah. about rape culture in general yeah. for me. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, here's the question. Have you ever engaged in any type of social media scuffle? I feel like as public figures, we've all mm. fallen victim <laughs> to that. Uh, Wendy, let me start with you. Um, well, May and I actually fought over like our biggest hoop earrings. <laughs> that's how we met. That's, actually. that's, that's how we met, <laughs> right. Uh, actually, we did know, a hoop size contest. Yeah, we did, and she is winning today, obviously. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm wearing hoops too. <laughs> I'm totally <laughs> losing today. I'm totally losing. Uh, you know, I have, but it doesn't go very far. Like I've, I've engaged in some people that obviously have disagreements with what I say, but then we, I, we try to go deeper, and sometimes it's just it doesn't work through social because Twitter yeah. is very short, and sometimes it's just like far right wing yeah. thoughts that just will never will never get to a middle ground and yeah. so there's it's fruitless you're smart for realizing it's fruitless at the very <laughs> yeah. beginning sometimes i yeah. fall victim to it and i go <laughs> on and on and then i feel like the idiot because they took me down to their level and i'm like what am i doing with my life right i really and i'll click on their twitter account they have like two followers <laughs> right right oh God, i'm an idiot and they it's an egg it's yeah an and egg. it's an egg it's like some anonymous <laughs> asshole who like probably doesn't even believe the stuff that they're tweeting to me right uh, Nathan, what about you well i try to stop I mean, from the get-go, when I see myself delving deeper and deeper, I've been a provoker too. I'm not going to try to hide that as well. But um, there was one instance where I was accused of self-indulgent tweets. So I, um, when I was in Kosovo, I was walking down the main street of its capital city called Pristina, and that's where everybody walks. And I had my straight hair and my big black sunglasses. And somebody was shouting out Kim Kardashian and taking pictures, mm -hmm. like as if I was Kim Kardashian <laughs> walking around in Pristina. Why would she be in Pristina, by the way? Mm -hmm. um, and so I just tweeted about that because I thought it was hysterical because as being somebody who's ethnically ambiguous, I get mistaken all the time for anybody who's ethnically ambiguous and yeah. on television I'm like I look absolutely not like her I also do not have ass injections like uh -huh. Kim Kardashian <laughs> um, so so I reported that and then somebody tweeted to me and said I'm unfollowing you because of tweets all about yourself and oh, that person would hate my Twitter <laughs> <laughs> my Twitter account is nothing but like promotions about what right. I'm doing yeah. pictures of what I'm doing <laughs> So That's what Twitter's for. It's supposed to be self-indulgent tweets. I, yeah, I, just, I, just, I thought it tweet out a photo of us. Right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, watch out Instagram because it can go on my tablet. But my response to him was, you know, have a beautiful life. I'm sorry that you found it reprehensible or yeah. whatnot. Because, I mean... That's the best way to deal with mm -hmm. it, man. Yeah, I mean, we've all fallen victim to it. It's, it's really easy to get dragged into it, but you've got to avoid it. What about you guys? Have you ever gotten mm -hmm. involved in some sort of political debate on social media? I've done it on Facebook. I've done it on Twitter. I've done it everywhere. How did it end? Did you change anyone's mind? Was it productive at all? We want to hear from you, so share your story in the section below, in the comments section, obviously, and we'll see you guys soon. If you pay attention to health news at all, you will definitely realize that every single thing on this planet leads to cancer. And there's a lot of fear mongering going on. And the latest situation involves bras. Do bras cause cancer? So first of all, let's start off with this study from six months ago. It says that wearing a bra for 12 hours a day left women more likely to develop breast cancer than a woman who rarely or never wears one. The scientists behind it hypothesize, not theorize, that wearing a bra could trap lymphatic fluids in your breasts, preventing um from moving around and releasing toxins. Now, they don't really explain why that is. Why do they trap the lymphatic uh, toxins? Uh, how does this happen? I mean, the study had method issues with its methodology, right? However, the new study says, don't worry, ladies, keep that support. It's good for you. Uh, the researchers in this study actually looked at 469 post-menopausal women who hadn't ever been diagnosed with breast cancer, comparing their habits to those of 1,000 women fighting breast cancer. They found no correlation between bra wearing and breast cancer. Now, I... Uh, what do you guys yeah. think about this? I'm so tired of these like cancer stories because yeah. everything causes cancer and I'm just like, uh, let me live my life, okay? Yes. Wendy. Well, lights and studios cause cancer also, <laughs> so thank you, Anna. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's scary. It's like one day coffee's good for you, one day coffee causes cancer, one day your bra is great for support, the next day it causes cancer. I don't like wearing underwire bras because those are really painful. So yeah. that I think that's probably number one. Um, I just think it's scary that we, 
everything is, well, it's like aimed at women. It's like a fear factor for women. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I'm curious as to who the people behind the study yeah. are. Even their title was like Dress to Kill. It's yeah. like, it's like something out of like The Devil Wears Prada or something. Yeah. Um, so I, I find it, I think it's interesting. I don't know if there's a real correlation. Yeah, I, don't, I really, look, I'm not a scientist. I haven't <laughs> looked into this. I'm hoping there's no correlation, but I'm gonna go right. with the more recent study that, that says that there isn't. Um, and by the way, dudes get it bad too. Like they're little swimmers, you know? They get impacted if they're wearing the tidy whiteies. And they, sometimes That's they true. want a little more support. They don't want stuff hanging around. <laughs> That's not sexy though. It's not sexy. <laughs> and poor Europeans who are Speedos at yeah. the beach. Um, you know, my my, my first thought with this, the study was really interesting, the way that it was relayed online. One thing that they did say was that if you did wear a bra less than 12 hours, but they didn't specify how much less was, then you dramatically reduce your chances of getting breast cancer. Right. What about 11 hours and 59 minutes? Is that okay? <laughs> okay. What time We're doing <laughs> And then the other thing that they mentioned, too, was that to to get rid of the toxins that might be in encouraged by keeping your lymphatic fluid trapped, you just need to rub your breasts or have mm. them rubbed. <laughs> I'm having them rubbed <laughs> by the right guy. <laughs> yeah. So again, again, I'm not really opposed yeah. to the solutions. Yeah, right. No, 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 I hear you. The solutions don't sound so bad. Maybe, you know, just to be on the safe side, call and up it, my honey, tell them like, hey, you need to massage the boobs, make what? sure they're okay. <laughs> Wasn't there another study that said by staring at boobs, you live longer? Oh my God! So, and saying, I wonder who I'm published saying. that study. Was it a group, it a group same, of female researchers or male researchers? Probably the same people behind this story. Yes, I don't know. Yeah, it's hilarious. <laughs> okay, so um, here's the question: Would you rather not wear a bra for the rest of your life on the chance that it could cause breast cancer, or cut out sugar and sweets for the rest of your life, knowing that processed sugar might cause cancer? This is tough. Mm -hmm. Mayfa, what about you? Actually, it's not really that tough for me because you're asking between the choice of making sure I don't have headlights all day and, ha and ingesting the cocaine of food, which is sugar, processed yeah. sugar. Yeah. And so I don't normally do that, and I find it actually very easy to abstain from sugar. And I, I hope that it, just because this is made public that nobody's going to be like surveilling my eating habits, yeah. but because um, well, I won't. Well, <laughs> I have a secret stash of cookies at work that I go to between the ending of our main show and the beginning of our post game show. I always have a bag of cookies. Uh -huh. I'm obsessed with sugar. I can't. I let them droop. I don't give a shit. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a big deal. I'm a salty. I'm a salty, salty? chips like salty crunchy mm -hmm. instead of sugary. So I think the girls in the 1960s when they were burning the bras had it right, you yeah. know? Just I'd go without the bra. Interesting. For sure. Um, I guess I guess I would also go without the bra and mm -hmm. wait. Would go without I'm both. No, 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 I'll eat no. the sugar. I'll take the sugar, take the and sugar. I'll, I'll get rid of the bra. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I'll do that. Exactly. That makes more sense to me. Anyway, what do you guys think? I mean, we also have a really large male audience, so you guys are probably like, what the fuck? What kind of question is that? How are we supposed to answer it? But, okay, let's let's make it male sensitive. Uh, you have to give up tidy whities or give up sugar. What do you do? Let's make it a little more difficult. You have to give up sports or sugar. What would you do? Comment in the section below. And also, what do you think about this bra story? Would you prefer your girl with a bra or without a bra? We're talking about publicly, so and other people are gonna see. Matter. And your mom. I, I wear white t-shirts a lot. <laughs> so. All right, guys, comment in the section below. We'll see you soon. Panera has joined a long list of chain restaurants that are asking people to not do open carry in their establishments. Now, Starbucks, Chipotle, Target, and a handful of other restaurants have asked their patrons to do the same thing or actually uh, avoid doing the same thing, which is carrying uh, weapons openly in their establishments. And the reason why they want to do that is because they want to keep a comfortable, safe environment and atmosphere there so people aren't intimidated or scared. They're also kind of concerned if everyone is carrying a weapon, how do you determine who the bad guy is and who the good guy is? It could lead to some confusion. So let me read you the statement from Panera. They say, Within our company, we strive to create Panera warmth. This warmth means bakery cafes where customers and associates feel comfortable and welcome. To this end, we ask that guns not be brought into this environment unless carried by an authorized law enforcement officer. I think that that makes all the sense in the world, but who knows, you guys might disagree with me. Maytha, make your point. Um, I think it would make sense to most people, but not to unarmed black people, because as the statement did mention that authorized law enforcement are allowed to carry weapons into their establishment as well, which is also the case for these under these other restaurants that have um, banned 
patrons with guns to come in. So for me, it'd be fair if we if that law was extended to law enforcement. And I think that's centrally what what is controversial for people who are pro-gun lobby is that, that they don't have the ability to protect themselves from law enforcement who right. are always armed. That's true, and I, excessive force by police is a huge issue right now. But do you think it makes the situation better if everyone's armed and they feel that a cop is a threat well, just, to them and they just, shoot them? Just That's don't gonna... don't allow the cops in yeah. with with weapons. Mm -hmm. Have, mm -hmm. Let them be outside, or I, I think that that's actually a really bad idea because, yeah. you know, as law enforcement, it's their job to have those weapons and to protect people. Now, don't get me wrong; excessive force is a huge issue. We speak out about it on the Young Turks all the time, but they are supposed to keep us safe with those weapons. They're supposed to have non-lethal weapons that they resort to first, and then a lethal weapon if someone poses an imminent threat. But I actually don't have a problem with cops having a weapon if they use it appropriately, which, of course, they're not doing at the moment. Right. Wendy. No, I would 100% agree with you on that. I do like law enforcement being ready to take control of a situation. And I, and I think in the media we've seen a lot of negative issues when it comes to police all across the country. Um, but I would say that also for the most part, the police do protect and serve mm -hmm. and serve a purpose. I, I don't want to go into a Starbucks or a Panera with somebody just having you know, their gun on the table. I would feel incredibly uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, having traveled though to Latin America, uh, Mexico specifically, I was shocked when I saw the Federales with like yes. their big guns and it's just a normal everyday thing and I, yeah. I, I would not be able to handle that. I love, that you brought that, I love that you brought that up because that was definitely a jarring element of traveling to Mexico. Mm -hmm. There were, you know, these big trucks. They were almost like Hummers. Um, yeah. and there were a bunch of, you know, military members sitting there with these huge rifles. And they're just, you know, <laughs> going down the street like it's no big deal. And it does create this environment of fear and intimidation. So right. I, I, I understand that. Um, so here's the question. What's something you've had to ask someone to stop doing? It could have been something really uncomfortable, but you just felt like you needed to do it, significant other, coworker, anything. Mm -hmm. Maitha, let me start with you. Whenever people use the word ghetto, I ask them what they mean by that. Because implicitly, what that's a code for is poor black people, even though what many people don't know or poor black neighborhoods, because that's what they're referring to, but they're trying to not say that. And yeah. so they'll say, oh, that's ghetto, or she's so ghetto, but what do you actually mean by it? And so when I ask them where it comes from, and almost like nine times out of 10 people don't know where it comes from, I explained to them that what it meant, it's an Italian word for a Jewish neighborhood that later became a camp, so a concentration camp for uh, Jewish people. So I think we need to be really conscious of the etymology of these words and what they mean now and for me, it's just very offensive. Yeah, mm. good point. Wendy? Uh, words obviously have a, a huge impact on how we see our society. So I'm gonna piggyback off May and just say, many years ago, I met uh, a friend of mine, we we're still really amazing friends. Uh, she had a son with Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. And at that time, because just verbatim or whatever, I would say a lot of things that I thought were dumb, like, oh my God, that's retarded. Yes. And yeah. so she, was very quick to snap me out of that and just correct me every time. And she said, you don't know how incredibly offensive it is to me as a mother with a child with Down syndrome, how you're using that word to describe something when it obviously has an impact on an actual person. Mm -hmm. And so since then, that was like really jarring for me and I've been very conscious of that. And when I hear people say that, I, I find myself channeling my friend Lily who taught me very early on not to use that word because of how offensive it really is. Yeah, having sensitivity to the origins of certain mm -hmm. words and how they impact certain groups of people makes all the sense in the world. I think that you know you guys gave really good examples of that. Um, I actually very recently had to talk to someone and ask them to stop doing something, and it was uncomfortable because it was something that had been going on for a long time, but I never had to, the courage to confront him about it. Mm. And so um, I felt that he was intentionally being like smug or condescending um, whenever I saw him and his statements toward me. And then finally, it just kind of reached a boiling point, and I had to tell him, like, you need to stop. And honestly, even though it was scary leading up to it, it was one of the best things that I ever did because this is someone that I respect and really like, and I wanted to, like, salvage our relationship. And it, had I not told him, you know, you need to stop this, he would have never realized it. And he wasn't intentionally being 
condescending at all. He didn't realize he was doing what he was doing. Mm -hmm. And so he was more aware of his behavior and that changed things and things are totally cool now. So yeah, sometimes you got to confront people about things that they do that you don't agree with. And even if they're your good friends and even if it makes you uncomfortable, that's the best way to handle the situation. So tell us what you guys think. Have you ever had to do something similar? Have you had to confront someone about something that they're doing that you don't like? And also, what do you think about this whole open carry issue? Would you feel comfortable in a restaurant or any type of establishment if if people are openly carrying weapons. Comment in the section below and we'll see you guys soon. All right guys, this was an awesome show as I expected because you've been on the show before and you both kick ass. Uh, but I want the audience to know more about you, where they can find you. Wendy, let me start with you. Sure, well you can find me on Twitter at Wendy Carrillo. I am a writer, journalist, producer, so I do a lot of stuff. So just find my links there. Awesome, and Matha. So I also have a Twitter account, and please don't harass me on there or drag me into fights. Um, I'm at M-A-Y, Alhassen, A-L-H-A-S-S-E-N, or you can hit me up through the contact section of my website, www.may, again, Alhassen, A-L-H-A-S-S-E-N, dot com. All right, thank you ladies, you guys are great. And if you want to see more of me, you can watch me on The Young Turks Monday through Friday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time. That's youtube.com slash The Young Turks. Or you can check me out on my personal YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Anna Kasparian. I'm on Twitter, Anna Kasparian, at Anna Kasparian, and Instagram, Anna Kasparian TYT. So I know I have a lot of <laughs> shit that you can follow me on. But I keep the stuff updated, you know? So if you want to know more, definitely check it out. And of course, we'll see you guys next week with another episode of The Point. He doesn't have to worry about this being on his record. However, the NFL uh, has suspended him indefinitely, and the Ravens have decided to uh, let him go. They ended his contract. Now, as I said, there are a lot of differing opinions as to what went down and how it went down, and I want to know what you guys think. Maitha, let me start off with you. What are your thoughts on this? Make your point. Firstly, this video is cringeworthy. It's really difficult to watch it a second time. Secondly, what I think is really interesting was the NFL's initial response, which was only a two-game suspension. And then, after it saw the reaction through social media, did it decide to, to release him, to suspend him throughout the whole season, the Ravens to release him indefinitely. So for me, I'm just, not, not that this is the most important thing, but I'm really concerned with the NFL more interested in protecting its brand than the issue of domestic violence. Yeah, the NFL had denied ever seeing. And also, CeeLo has been dropped from more concerts after he made a very questionable statement on Twitter about the issue of rape. And also, do bras cause cancer? Some studies indicate yes, others indicate no. We'll get into the details of that, and we'll end the show on a discussion about open carry. Panera joins a number of other chain restaurants that have asked people to not show up to their restaurant with assault rifles out in the open. So before we get to all of that, um, I do want to start off with a story that has been making headlines this week. The Ray Rice video featuring him basically punching his then fiance at the time and knocking her out has been released by TMZ. It is a difficult video to watch and believe it or not, opinions toward that video have been split. I want you guys to take a look at it and then we'll discuss it further. They had seen the, uh, the tape when they had made that two-game suspension. Um, but there are people who worked at the hotel who have spoken out on condition of anonymity, and they said, no, no, no. The NFL had seen the tape. There's no question about it. So that is a little bit of a he said, she said situation. But considering the fact that that original video was released by TMZ, I mean, they knew that a two-game suspension was probably a little too lenient in that case. Now, um, Wendy, before you make your point, I want to read a comment that Janae Palmer released via Instagram after she found out that Ray Rice uh, was going to have his contract terminated by the Ravens. She said the following, No one knows the pain that the media and unwanted opinions from the public has caused my family. To make us relive a moment in our lives that we regret every day is a horrible thing. To take something away from the man I love that he has worked his ass off for all his his life to gain ratings is horrific. Gotten into a verbal altercation and then it continued in the elevator where he punched her 
with a single punch to the face, basically. She hits the rail with her head, and then she's unconscious. And then you see her trying to drag her body outside of the elevator. She's unresponsive. And uh, the AP was somehow able to obtain a better video that gives even more detail into what happened. And even though they haven't released that video, they do say that it makes clear that uh, Janae Palmer, his fiance at the time, who is now his wife, did spit on him uh, a few times and that she did attempt to strike him as well. So it was a physical altercation um, and both sides uh, did participate in it. And I should note that she faced assault charges as well as he did. However, there was a, a trial intervention where he was able to get involved in a program so he wouldn't have to face further prosecution. So, What's up, everyone? Welcome to this week's episode of The Point. I'm your host, Anna Kasparian, and we have an all-female panel on the show today. In fact, let's go ahead and meet our panelists. We have Wendy Carrillo, who is a returning panelist. She's a journalist and radio show host. You know I love having you on the show. Love being here, thank you. Yes, thank you for coming on. And Maitha Al Hassan is also a returning guest. Uh, you did a great job last time, lots of really interesting points. So I'm very excited to see what you have to say about the topics today. And thank you for having me and saying my last name correctly. It's <laughs> very important. It's a beautiful name. All right, so let me tell you guys what we're going to talk about on the show today. Of course, there's the longer version of the Ray Rice assault video that has been leaked or released by TMZ. We're going to get into the nitty gritty of that story. And then we're also going to discover uh, who these teenagers are who did this really terrible ice bucket prank on an autistic kid. It's a really terrible story and it touches on the issue of bullying.